Hi guys. I hope you're doing well today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for what you're what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. I thank you for the healing and restoration that will come through this sermon. Let, let Rachel die and you live. Because it's not I who who lives, but it's you who lives in me. Speak to me, speak through me. Open the portals of heaven and pour up blessings that we that we don't have room enough to receive. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Hi guys. Um, f- for exciting reasons, I'm doing. Um, some research on the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Now, I can't tell you what those reasons are, but it looks like God is going to do some exciting things. He he is always doing exciting things, but it looks like God is going to do some really exciting things in my life, and I'm so excited. So as a part of that, of the exciting thing, thing that God, God is doing or he's working on on my behalf, I'm doing um, a, a kind of research on the 9-11 attacks. And yesterday, I was reading um, uh, as part of that research, I was reading a book called The Only Plane in the Sky. And it's a very unique book. Um, it's a book of stories of what ha- of survivors and um, of the attacks and all of that. And for those of you who don't know, uh, for the millennials that might have been born after two, after 2001, who don't know what I'm talking about, on September 11th, 2001, uh, two planes, two passenger planes uh, were hijacked by by uh, terrorists, by the Al Qaeda terror terrorist group, um, and thrown into the World Trade Center, which is um, um, which is a it was two buildings that would have uh, business and commerce and all kinds of things were in there, like restaurants and biz- businesses and financial businesses and banks and shops and all of that. Um, they were they were two twin towers. You you, if you don't know what that is, you can Google it and find it. Um, uh, they were amazingly tall structures. They were like a hundred and something floors. And when the planes hit, um, a few about an hour after, um, the first building came down, and then the the no. The second building hit came down first, and the first building hit came down second. It was an amazing massacre, loss of life. Over 3,000 people died that day. And there was also um, a plane on that same day um, that flew into the Pentagon which is in the U.S., the place of government and 
secured um, um, one of their places of government. So a plane hit there. And I believe the fourth plane was going to hit the Capitol building. But uh, the, the attackers at that point were were thwarted by these brave souls who heard about what was going on in New York and who heard about what was going on in the Pentagon. Um, so these, these brave civilian passengers and crew uh, decided to overtake the plane they lost their lives, but they saved so many other lives. And uh, they were very brave to, to give up their lives for their country. Um, yeah, it, it was a sad day. Um, I remember being in high school and my law teacher, I was about to be 17 at that time. My law, my law teacher uh, came in and said, planes just hit the World Trade Center. And me be, being an ignorant Canadian person didn't even know what that was. I had to ask what that was. And I, I remember the terror. I remember, are we going to be next? Because we didn't know whether the CN Tower was going to be hit. We didn't know how far reaching it was. I remember being so scared as a 17-year-old girl in, in Mississauga at the time. And it was horrifying seeing all, all the f- footage from the news of people jumping and uh, just the massacre that these uh, people had had uh, brought to uh, North America. I remember being so scared as a seven, as a sixteen year old girl. Uh, I was I was seventeen on that Friday, and I remember just the terror and the sadness. I remember for for weeks after, that's all you saw on the news and that's all you that's all you um, heard about on the news. It was horrifying. Um, so anyway, I'm doing a deep dive into that and as I was reading, as I was reading Um, the only plane in the sky. The one thing I kept hearing in every story was I I called my loved one and told them that I love them. I just kept on hearing hearing, uh, people telling them, people telling um, people I love you, I'm just calling to say I love you, and what, and I, I love you, I love you, I love you, over and over and over again, because when people realized that the buildings had been hit, and the planes were going down, their only thoughts were to tell their family members that they loved them. And I began to think away from 9 11. That, that, that's, that was the commonality, no matter who they were, no matter what color of skin they were, no matter if they worked up in the uh, fifth floor or 105th floor, no matter if they were a bank manager or um working at Neiman working at Neiman Marcus or 
working in the restaurant. All they wanted their family and friends to know before death was that they loved them. And I think we often, we often kind of uh, forget about the little things. We often forget to tell those around us that they are loved, that they are cared for. And it is not to the point until the point of death that we remember that. And I just said, if we could remember that before, if we could remember how much more in common God has made us than different, it would be a much better world. Um, like, cause I think that we get so wrapped up in materialism that we just for, forget about all of that until, until the rubber meets the road, until we get, until we get a diagnosis or until we get whatever, um, we get, we forget that the most important thing is to tell those ones that we love that we love them. And I, I really think that's what the world is crying out for. That's what we as a people are crying out for, is just love. It's just someone to put our... Uh, to, to put their arms around us and say, you're loved, you're cared for, you're significant. And I'm here today to tell you that you're loved, you're cared for, and you're significant. And you have gifts, you have talents, you have treasures to offer, you have stuff to offer. You don't have to keep living um, below like you're some second-class citizen. You're not. You're a citizen of the kingdom of God. And he has called you to be great wherever you are, wherever you sit. He's called you to be his ambassador. And that's wonderful to even think of. Um, when I think of um, what we what we do when we're when we're hit with a diagnosis or or some some calamity in our life, it kind of shrinks um, everything down to what's really important and what really matters. I think that we often get so materialistic and so caught up in ourselves that we often forget what really matters until we're faced with a loss of life or loss of a job or a loss of any kind of loss. I think that that we need to remember um, the one thing that the, that the Lord get, told us was to love him with all our with all our being and to love each other as we love ourselves but I think the problem stems from when we don't love ourselves and when we try and um, cover up the fact we don't love ourselves with, um, we, we try and cover it up with stuff. And we try and cover it up with makeup and all this stuff and getting facelifts and getting butt lifts, which I learned about last night. I didn't even know that those were a thing, but yeah. Um, we try and cover it up with all these meaningless 
things when at the end of the day, we just need to know that we are loved. And even if we don't have people in our lives to tell us how much we are loved, we are loved by the Father. I was watching A.J. McLean from the Backstreet Boys, and he says, and he was talking about his sobriety and all that stuff, um, and he's like, and the interviewer asked, what, what, what is the difference between you now and then, or something like that? He said, well, I love myself now. And I think that we use all these external things, whether it be addictions like drug or alcohol or addictions to social media, addictions to sex or addictions to approval. We all have some addictions somewhere. It's it's when any behavior takes over your life. That is an addiction. It, it, and you can't live without that behavior. Like you crave that behavior. And you need that behavior to exist. That's, an, that's the racial definition of an addiction. Um, So anything can be an addiction. Even your your children could be an addiction. You could want to give them everything and everything and everything. And you're addicted to making them happy or you're addicted to making your boyfriend happy or your girlfriend happy. Um... And you're addicted to it. You have to, you have to have it because it gives you a high. And I think those things can cover up the fact that you don't love yourself. You don't cannot see your internal significance. And and I. I think if you can't see your internal significance, everything, nothing external will be enough. But if you do see your internal significance, everything external adds to that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't dress up. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go out anyhow. I'm not saying if you like makeup or stuff, uh, that it's a bad thing and you shouldn't do that, do it. But make sure you're doing it to add to you. You're not doing you're not doing it to cover it up uh, with something wrong. You're doing it to add to who you are. You're not doing it to define who you are. You're doing it because you want to add to um, the definition of who you are. And, or you want to just dress up because you want to look nice. And we all do. We all love putting on fancy dresses and fancy clothes. And we all love doing what we're doing once in a while. But when that becomes your, when your internal struggle, when your internal struggle um, becomes your external significance, I, I, that's a problem. Because if you're not happy with yourself on the, on the inside, nothing you do externally will will cover that up. It'll it'll only feed it for a time, 
and then you'll and you'll need more and more and more and more. And the Lord wants you to get your internal significance from him. Like, that's why he can see every part of you. And he loves every part of you. He, he thinks you're so awesome. And he doesn't look so much at uh, the mistakes you made or whatever. He looks at you through his blood, through his power and his significance. And he wants to me, to me to tell you today, you are significant. You are significant, you are significant, you are significant. You are significant whether you're a believer or not. You are significant whether you're a part of the LGBT community or not. You are significant not be not because you are something. You are significant just because you are. Um, it's not because you are a doctor that brings your significance. It's not because of what you do. It's not because of your, uh, your entertainer. That's what you do. That's what you love. That, that's your job. But you are significant because... You are human. Every human is significant. And, ev and every human deserves to be treated with significance, with love, with respect, with dignity, with generosity. It doesn't matter if you agree with... Um, how they live their life or not, or whatever, they still deserve significance. And, and they still are significant. And just for the thought, for the simple fact that they are human, every human is significant. Even every animal is significant. Um, every being on this earth that God has created it, it is significant, and he needs all of us. Um, the whole thing about um, God doesn't need you. I I understand the sense of it. It's it's to prevent people from getting uh, too full of themselves. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, if you're struggling with your significance and you think nobody needs you, God needs you and you're important. He needs. He needs your gifts and your talents. The, the thing is, if that need to please takes over your life and you think all he needs is you and you think people can exist without you, and that's not a significance problem. That can also be a self-esteem problem because you, you could think that people need you ex externally, but inside you think, you, I'm a piece of crap. When nobody's around, you, you could think, I'm a piece of crap. But but you could be thinking, you could be saying, everybody needs me. But inside, you think that nobody needs you. And that 
that could be uh, to push uh, real relationships away. Because oftentimes we're afraid to really let people see us see our brokenness, see our shame, see us. And I don't think you should let every everyone see see you. But I think um I think um I, um I think everyone should have what what Matt, what Matt Collender, I think it's Matt Collender. I'm saying his last name wrong, um, but I th- I think what he what he said last night was so good. He said he was talking about pastors and leaders, and he said that every pastor and leader needs a king's table, needs a group of of people that are not there for their books that are not there because they have a mega church that are just there for the person uh, that could handle their flaws, that can, you know, straighten them out. He was like, everybody needs a Jonathan and everybody needs a Nathan. Like a Jonathan that says, Wherever you go, I go. And a Nathan that can tell you, man, you're being ridiculous and really mean it in the best healthy healthy way. Not to call you down, but to bring you up. And I think and I think the key to life is really having someone see you completely and still love you. Having someone know you completely and still love you. And that's a scary thing. That's a scary thing. But when you let it happen, it's so wonderful. And before you can let people see you completely and without um, without putting up barriers... You need to let God in like that. And he will show you who your king's table is. Because everybody's um, a king in their own right and a queen in their own right. And everybody needs a king's table or a queen's table. Not just leaders. Everybody needs people that sees them um, just for who they are. Jesus had... Peter, James, and John, which, which were his friends and brothers um, that he let see him in all his glory, and they were not, they were protective of him. They gathered around him, they covered him, which was amazing. And I think life is 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 missing something when you don't have a have a king's or queen's table it adds to you and the first person that you need to let see you that you need to let into every aspect of your life with Jesus Christ and I'm not saying uh, just salvation. I'm saying um, many people are saved, but they don't let God see them in every aspect of their life. They they don't let him into the broken places. They're like, God, yes, you save my soul. I believe you died for my sins. I believe that you're coming back again, and that's where it stops. But no, no, honey, he wants, he wants you to be an open book. He already sees you. He already loves you, and he loves what he sees. He's not mad at you. He just wants to be a part of your life. 
He wants to be all of your life, not just a part. And he wants to share with you. He wants to share your pain with you. He wants to share your joys with you. He wants to share all of that with you. And when you let him in, let him really in and let him take over aspect, um, every aspect of your life. It is another, and it is another thing altogether. It is just so amazing, and he just wants that. He wants to be the first one at your king's table. He wants to be your trusted friend that you tell all your secrets to, things that you wouldn't tell anyone else. He he wants to be. And when he's at the head of your king's table, he will let you know who to trust. He will let you know who to bring in. He will let you know where to stop, where to start. And... And you won't do this thing alone. It'll become it'll become uh, so much more than a Sunday morning prayer. He wants this relationship with you to be much more than a Sunday morning one scripture day thing. He wants it to be a constant daily thing where you ask for wisdom, where you ask for truth strength where you share your life with him. And he wants that with you today, tomorrow, and forever. And let me say this, he'll he'll never leave you nor forsake you, and he'll be with you throughout all of life and Life won't be easy, but it's easier because you'll have someone to go through life with and help bring in the right human friends and and mentors and people in your life. And yes, there'll be seasons of hardship, but there will be seasons of joy. There there will be seasons of hardship, but there will be seasons of joy. Let me say that again. There will be seasons of hardship, but there will be seasons of joy. And embrace the seasons of joy just as much as you, as you go through the hardship and embrace what it's teaching what it teaches you. You don't embrace hardship. You you um you go through hardship and you grow through hardship and embrace what it has to teach you. You grow through hardship. You go through hardship and then you grow through hardship and then embrace what it has to teach you. And that's the significance of life. And that's what he wants wants to be in. And no matter where you are, you are significant. You are loved. You are valuable. You are heard. You are seen. You know, you know the most powerful thing I heard ever? God sees you. You right there. You taking care of those kids. You doing real estate. You, you, you being a single mom to that special needs child. God sees you and he loves you. You with a disability. You, he sees you and loves you, and all, and he has given you gifts no matter uh, what, what stage you're in. 
He's given you gifts. He's given you something to do. So, so rule in the lane he's given you. Because whatever he's given you is significant. Whether he's given you the platform of being a mom, whether he's given you the platform of living in um, an independent living facility, whether he's given you the platform of a preacher to preach to hundreds or thousands, whatever he's given you to do, rule in that, rule in that thing, rule in that echelon of society, because we need, we need believers in every echelon of society. We need believing garbage men. We need believing people in in independent living. We need believing teachers. We need believing pastors. But you don't have to be a pastor to be significant in his kingdom. Whatever gifts he's given you. A lot of people say, what's my purpose? What am I meant to do? Well, what do you wake up? in the morning and think of doing right off. Oh, you could say looking at my phone. Okay, if you tell me that, I'd be like, what on the phone do you look at? Or you can say cat videos or news or whatever. Okay. So what kind of cat videos do you look at? Or what kind of news do you look at? See, I think we think finding purpose is a, is a big thing it is. But I think your life right then, most of the time, gives you clues as to what your purpose is. Um, I used to love to go like Disney movies and all that stuff. And I used to be very creative. I used to write and I wrote music and all that stuff. And now I'm just... Now I'm looking forward to starting my own film production company because I know that's what I love and I know that's my way, that's my purpose to bring light and laughter to the world. Not always through Christian movies but uh, or through Christian entertainment but just just through what God has given me to do. But when I look at it now He's given me clues all along the way. My first Disney collection, the fact that I collected all those Disney movies and would come up with different storylines, the fact that when I was 10, I I wrote um, in, you know, I, I wrote a book and it was in my, my school's library. You know, that gave me a hint to to my writing career and the fact that I used to make up plays and stories and see things that people don't see. Sometimes when I'm, I'm watching something, I would, watching a movie, I would say, you know what, if that were my movie, I'd do this and... I'd come up with ideas for that, you know, using that framework because I'm that creative kind of person. And I've written plays that way. I've written musicals that way because I've always begun to see what other people don't see. What area of life 
do you see what others don't see? I'll say that again. What area of life do you see what others don't see? See, sometimes when I'm watching a sermon, because I'm a preacher and I'm also a creative person, uh, I may not critique the sermon. The sermon's great, but I'm saying, but I will say, I would say, well, a way to bring that point point forward would be this or that or this. Not that I'm critiquing, but my gift for preaching and my gift for creativity married to say that this would this would be um perhaps a more effective way to bring that forward and because it's my purpose and it's because it's my gift that's why the lord shows it to me so when i see a sermon uh not every sermon, by the way, but a sermon by one or two uh, particular people. Um, I'm like, hey, this would be a good way to to illustrate that if the person wanted to, because it's my gift. So what other people might see a good sermon I see a whole creative thing because it's my gift. And it's not that the sermon is bad. It's just that because it's my calling and my gift, I can, I kind of see beyond what people can see. So in what area of your life do you see beyond what others see? Because that area is your purpose. Look closer at that area and you'll see your purpose. So do you like, do you freak out when when things are not organized and just so? Maybe that's part of your gift to help people organize themselves. Are are you good at are you good at um helping situations de escalate when you see other people getting into a fight? Are you good at coming up with compromises and solutions? Maybe that is your career. Your purpose is most often in what you do right now. It's most often not something you have to find. It's something that you have to bring forth, birth forth. Um, Because... In my Bible college, I wrote a story for an essay that said, um, I'm pregnant with purpose. Um, So purpose is not something you have to find like, oh, Lord, what is my purpose? It's something that you have to bring forth. And that seat and you can see the seeds of your purpose in your life. Like, like, what, what issue really gets in your craw, really gets you going? In that seed, maybe your purpose. I didn't mean to go here. And I've been talking for almost an hour now. Pretty close to an hour. 
And I I really didn't mean to go here, but the Lord was doing something. So thank you, Lord, for filling my mouth and doing what you need to do. I thank you, Lord. Um, the Lord wants you to know that you are significant, that you have always been significant. And he wants you to to get your significance, to understand your significance doesn't come from being a believer, doesn't come from, from being a doctor, doesn't come from your profession. But it comes from being human. And of course, being a believer in Jesus Christ enhances your life. And it becomes your life and it makes your life richer. But I was saying... Even if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, even if you are an atheist, even if you don't know the Lord at all, you are still significant. You are still significant. He still made you significant. The only difference between believers and non-believers I believe, I know people like to disagree with this, is knowledge, the knowledge and the application of God's word, it makes life richer. It makes life worth living. But you, ha- but you have worth even if you're even if you're not a believer, you still have worth. But if you're not a believer, you don't know how much God loves you. You may not even care if there's a God. But I'm telling you, uh, being a believer will make your life richer. Will make decisions easier because you'll have someone to run them by. And being a believer, going to church will not give you significance because you're born with that no matter who you are. But it will it will give you the richness and you will direct your significance to the right way. Because the risk of not being a believer and knowing your significance, you may direct that significance to yourself rather than rather than knowing that that significance comes from him. He he wants you and loves you so much. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. We love you. We bless you and give you praise. In the name of Jesus, amen. And all you need to do is to start the relationship journey with him is to ask him, is to pour out your heart and tell and tell him what you need. Tell him what's on what's on your heart. Tell him what your feelings are. Tell him tell him whatever you want to tell him, and he will fill you. All you have to do is believe that he is, and confess that he is. But I. But I would say that sometimes you don't even have to believe what he is, that he is. You just have to say, I know, um, I, 
I can be, like you could say, God, I don't know if you are, but something she says really got to me. I really, um, I really am feeling something there. Show me. And I'm telling you, he's got enough to show, to show you. So, even if you don't believe, there's a way through. Because one thing I've learned about God is if you give him an inch, he'll take over your life in the best way. And you won't be alone and he'll show you things. He'll show you you in the, in the most awesome way possible. The Bible does say, if you have faith, as much of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And I've experienced myself too, even if you have no faith, even if you just, you could come to God on a maybe. There's, there's someone today that is so unsure about this thing that you're, you're feeling that what she has to say, what this person is saying is really significant, but I don't believe yet. I'm, I don't go to church. I'm not a believer. I'm uh, not whatever. But what she has to say is really getting to me. It's And he's saying, come, and God is saying right now to this person, whoever you are, come to me on a maybe. Come to me on a maybe. And he's saying, what do you have to lose? You've tried everything. You've tried social media. You've tried friends. You've tried sex. You've tried alcohol. You've tried drugs. What do you have to lose? Nothing. But you, but I'm telling you, you'll gain your life in a relationship with Christ. You'll gain your life, you'll gain perspective on yourself and others. Just give him a chance. And if he fails, he won't fail. But if he does, you'll be no worse off anyway. And at least you can say you tried. So chew on that food for thought until next time. Bye, guys. See you See you next week.